J Knights and welcome back to the What the Austin podcast. We are back for another villain off and we were discussing, I'm pretty sure this is our fourth villain off now, which is totally wild to think about um, that there's been so many, but we love doing this every year. So we're excited to come back and I just love my spooky season episodes, you know, I love making them. They're some of my favorites to make every year. Um, so yeah, I'm excited guys about this one. I hope you are too. Love this tradition. This tradition's so much fun. Um, I, I just think the villain offs are just some of the most fun to debate. And we were just saying that it was really fun for the three of us to all get together in person for the first time at the festival. So yeah, back on our screens, but grateful for the time we got together. Yeah, completely agree. It is definitely strange. Like you said, we were discussing a minute ago how Weird it is now we're back on screens, but it's really cool to be back here doing this tradition, even if we're not in person. Maybe one day we'll have to do it in person, that would be cool. But yeah, because I think also the villain off is a really, really nice episode to do some really cool character studies as well. So it's a really nice format. It's really interesting. We get so many ideas out of it. So I'm also a huge fan of this. Not to big ourselves up. But... <laughs> I'm a big fan of us. <laughs> big fan of us. <laughs> I would love to do one in person as well, but I feel like the only issue with us doing one in person is I would have to have my own setup because like podcast studios are rented by the hour and that would totally like screw us all over because we just talk for forever. So it cost me a fortune to rent somewhere, I reckon. (laughs) We'll have to do a makeshift recording studio or something outside. I think so. Definitely figure that out one day definitely so today new villain off who are we discussing so our characters this year are going to be general tilney and um sir walter elliott so we're doing northanger abbey versus persuasion so i'm super excited about this guys do you want to let everyone know who's taking which character this year i am well i'm talking about general tilney i'm not general tilney because he's a horrible person like pluto <laughs> i was about yeah, I'm yeah. general tilney I was about to say I am General Tilney. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. Oh. <laughs> I'll be channeling some North Hanger Abbey. I guess that's quite in keeping with the spooky season vibes as well. But uh, yeah, so that's me. Yeah, and then yeah. I'll be taking the lead on Sir Walter Elliot, uh, Anne's father from Persuasion. We'll see where we end up right by the end of this. I feel like we often end up changing each other's minds. I know, and I feel like I. I'm not sure where I'm going to land this time. Like I still kept thinking yeah. it through and I was still a bit like, I'm not sure. Um, so I'm excited. So what we'll do as always is we'll do a brief summary of each and then we'll look at some um, ways in which they are similar and dissimilar and just see who's worse. Like who's going to win villain off 2024 because that is the big debate, right? That's why we're here because uh, <laughs> we need to crown a new winner. Okay, fab. So who wants to kick things off with their summary? Okay. <laughs> do it, I'll yeah. do it. You let's, go. Um, let's go, General Tilney, because yeah, I feel I feel because the book is set in Bath and I'm in Bath. I feel like we're quite, you know, it was a good one, a good one to go with for this. But what I'll do is I will quickly just do a little bit of background about who he is, and also just introduce the novel as well for a bit of context and as to why he's seen as a villain in Austin. So, General Tilney, he is, in fact, I came across an article recently that described him as an ogre-ish character, which I thought was pretty extreme. So (laughs) that was like the headline for this, an ogre-ish character. And he is essentially a parody, though, of a gothic villain, I think. So as many people know who have read Northanger Abbey, it is a bit of a parody on what was kind of popular during that time of these gothic novels coming out. And I think Catherine's this is kind of just my headline assumptions but Catherine arguably who is the heroine of the story I think misreads and makes him even more of a villain than maybe he is and we'll find out why um just because of her imagination and how she's influenced by these gothic novels that she's reading in the book so he's very exaggerated and almost a bit a little bit like a caricature I think in some places so my question is with General Tilney, you know, is he really bad, you know, potentially accused of murder in the book, or is he just a bit of a snob and money mad? I think there's two sides to it here. In terms of the book itself, so as I've mentioned, gothic fiction, um, this was really big at the time, and I think, yeah, what Austin was doing was doing her own parody of it. So this sort of started off 
like mid 1700s when people were starting to write about gothic fiction so you've got authors such as Mary Shelley and Anne Radcliffe um, who is mentioned in the book as well quite a lot and a lot of these gothic novels share this theme of usually a bit of a feminine struggle against uh, like a tyrannical threat so in a female gothic the main threat against the heroine is usually society itself and the fact that women are powerless and they must be kept pure and protected by men so that's quite an interesting context to have to this one whereas like if it's a male gothic book they're more threatened by like supernatural powers so they get all that cool stuff going on whilst for females it's just like oh there's a man that's being annoying again so yeah the, kind of the biggest period of popularity for this was around like the 1790s to 18. 20s and Northanger Abbey was obviously published in 1817 but she was probably working on it around 1794 so right in the height of when this was happening and what's interesting is one of the biggest publishing houses for gothic novels at this time the Minerva Press like six out of seven gothic fiction books they published was mentioned in this book so that's kind of the context I just want to throw in there for this one um, which is really interesting and then in terms of just yeah i'm sorry i was just going to say as well if anybody wants some insights into some of the horrid novels that are mentioned me and martha have done multiple episodes now on a few of them the most recent one was on eliza parsons um the castle of wolvenback so that was literally the last episode that came out so if anyone's interested you can go and listen into that sorry l carry on yes no that was a great plug i think that'd be a really good follow-up for this as well so yeah please do go listen to that nice one um, so just to very quickly summarise General Tilney himself as a character. So he is um, Henry's father in this book. So he's the hero of, of Northanger Abbey um, and also his sister Eleanor and another brother Frederick, isn't it, as well. Um, he is a widower. He was a member of the military and he comes from a wealthy family. He married a woman um, who was an heiress. We find out in the book, I think it's Mrs. Allen, who says that his his wife who who passed away was an heiress of £20,000, which was a lot of money. Again, if you think about Mr Darcy, with his £10,000 to compare. So she's got £20,000, which is a lot. So already we've got yeah, money. Given giving, giving Emma money. Woodhouse as well. I feel like that's a very similar dowry to what Emma Woodhouse would have gone with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, that's kind of who he is and how he's situated in the book. And I think what's really interesting with this is Austen plays with this idea again of a gentleman versus wealth which comes up a lot in her books especially you know like in Pride and Prejudice you have Elizabeth Bennet calling Darcy out because you know he, oh no it's not Darcy who is it she calls out it is Darcy isn't it saying well because she is a gentleman's daughter essentially so just because you've got all this wealth it doesn't mean you're not acting you know you don't have to act like that just because you've got money so Henry Tilney is the youngest son but he acts as more of this gentleman character than potentially his father who is wealthy and um, and head of the family so that's him I don't know if we want to introduce your side or do we continue with this one no let's do it let's choose Sir Walter Elliot and then we'll start doing some talking through sure okay well I just wanted to start start by saying that I think it it is an important distinction and thing to name that Northanger Abbey and persuasion are sort of two different genres and how that might impact how we view the characters. And just like you said, Northanger Abbey was written early and it's a parody of Gothic, Gothic novels. And then persuasion was written between 1815 and 1816. And it's um, Jane's it's known as Jane's more mature novel with its more uh, her most mature heroine. And yeah, written between 1815 and 1816. And it was her last completed novel. So yes, I'm focusing on Sir Walter Elliot. Sir Walter Elliot is a 53-year-old baronet. Uh, he lives in Cullinge Hall in Somersetshire. And yeah, you can make fun of my American accent <laughs> pronouncing that. And he is... Anne Elliot's father. He's a widower. He was married to Anne's mother, Elizabeth. And only on this reread, I think it's very interesting that the eldest daughter, Elizabeth, was named after their mother, because actually Anne is the one who takes after her mother, both in looks and regarding disposition and budgeting. And then Sir Walter, Sir Walter also has his oldest daughter, Elizabeth, 
who is kind of the mirror image of him. She she looks like him. She behaves the way he does. And then there's dear Mary, who is the youngest daughter. So when Elizabeth is only 16 and Anne's only 14, they lose their mother. So he's a widower and he ends up having their family friend, Lady Russell, kind of act as the surrogate mother, but they, they're just friends. They never marry. Um, and you see basically our inner introduction to Sir Walter Elliot is he's, he's meticulously reading the family history and the part that describes his life and himself uh, is his favorite part. Um, and there are just so many good quotes here, but maybe I'll wait to, to get into some of them. But you're struck pretty quickly with um, his focus on rank and his focus on attractiveness. And so throughout the novel, you see that because he has taken the family into debt after Anne's mother has passed away, because she was sort of the person who helped him keep his spending issues under control. That is the catalyst for them having to move to Bath. And you see during their time at Bath, um, just sort of how he neglects his children and what his main focuses are, which are usually around associating with people of high rank and uh, who are very attractive. And then you end up seeing how that neg negatively impacts not only him, but his daughters. And yeah, I will. That's kind of a preliminary intro on him. I love that. No, I think they were both really good intros to our characters. Um, but something that I definitely want to chat about first, then, because I think this is something that links to both of them, is this focus on status. Because I feel like it's important to both of these characters. Obviously, like you're saying, Sir Walter Elliot spends all his time like reading back through the family histories and like he's really obsessed with um being seen with certain people in society that he deems like worthy um but then also general tilney right he actually does hold quite a bit a strong title he married into money as well like he already had his own wealth and status um and obviously the biggest issue that he has with catherine is when she finds out she's not wealthy or of any any means and not from a great family and that's why he ends up kicking her out in the middle of the night so um yeah let's chat about status and why it's so important to them and who, who's worse with it? So much drama. I can't wait to get onto that bit. But as you were talking, Kaylee, just as you said, Izzy, there are so many similarities, I think, which come from these two characters. And as you were talking, more and more were coming out to me. So I think this is a really interesting combination to explore. And like you say, especially this idea on status and wealth. And I think for General Tilney, I think it is more the wealth side that comes out from him obviously there is status but I think he's almost more obsessed with money I would say and um Walter Elliot is potentially more on the status side I don't know if you'd agree with that <laughs> at all but maybe I we'll would, see what, what evidence I would agree with that completely Sir Sir Walter is very much about how things come across to people about appearances and um that he comes across as a gentleman and that he's associating with people of of higher rank. What, what comes to mind is how even though he has not been on speaking terms with them for years, when he goes to Bath, he seeks an acquaintance with the Viscountess Lady Dalrymple and her daughter. And he is just very focused on making sure that their visit that, that that their cards are on display so that everyone sees that he's associating with them and on the flip side of that he is very hard on Anne when she wants to visit her friend in Westgate and he does does not think that that makes the family look good everything even the retrenchment process he, I agree, Elle, he seems less concerned about the money, but just more concerned about, will I still come across as this person mm -hmm. of high status who appears high class? Yeah, Ooh, yeah. I think I love I think that. that is... I was just going to say, like, that's not something that I thought about before, though, in the sense that um, 
it just made me realize that General Tilney really doesn't actually care about what people think about him. Like the guy parades around just doing his own stuff. And I'm trying to think of like the few times that I remember him socializing. The only one I can think of is when he takes John Thorpe aside just to get the lowdown on Catherine. Like he doesn't really go around talking. I think the only reason he came to Bath is because Eleanor says that Henry's interested in this woman there. So he just comes to kind of pry on the situation. But yeah, yes. so Walter Elliot's very front and centre in society, whereas General Tilney really is not. Yeah, I agree. I think he takes a very background sort of position in this novel. I remember him not being a character that I really tapped into until on rereads, if that makes sense. The more you read, the more you find, obviously with most Austen books anyway. But I think with General Tilney, before you find out, I think, about how much of a villain he is, it's this is gradually built up. Um, through the book where, and you sort of see through Catherine's eyes most of the time what he's actually like so you first meet General Tilney as you say in Bath so him and his family have come here to stay as many people have and um, as you say one of the first main interactions we have with him is this point when you say John Thorpe pulls him aside I think when they're all at the theatre and speaking to each other about Catherine because he's noticed Henry and her and his daughter have been all hanging out quite a lot, balls and that. Um, not sure he'd call it that back then, but anyway. So T Thorpe sort of comes back and reports to Catherine that they've been talking about her and sort of bigging her up. At this point, we don't know, but he's actually told General Tilney or given the impression that she's from a lot of money and has wealth. And he also relates to Catherine that General Tilney is, he describes him as a fine old fellow, a gentleman, like good sort of fellow has ever lived. And he admires Catherine. And I think, firstly, I mean, that's a huge red flag because you cannot trust John Thorpe in this, okay? So he is not a character to trust. And the fact that he comes back saying that he's a gentleman, like good sort of fellow, um, I don't think is, is the one to, to take and just run with, to be honest. So, and also the fact that there's all this, these misunderstandings that are going on at the same time, you know, when Catherine's trying to meet up with the Tilneys, but then she keeps being dragged off by John Thorpe and, and Isabella. And I think eventually she finds herself at their lodgings because she's come to apologise, I think, at some point about the fact that they haven't been able to, to meet up. Um, and she also gets to dine with them at some point as well. And I think she starts to notice these little things and about the way um, Henry and Eleanor act in his presence so when she goes to dinner she describes his children have like a want of spirits and later Henry and Miss Tilney sort of try and make up for the fact that they weren't very lively during this dinner so at the ball they're sort of trying to make up for this and be more lively with her and yeah just almost apologize for the fact that it was it was like that so it's interesting you start to get these little yeah, glimpses into maybe what kind of character he is. You keep getting, you know, one side you've got someone calling him great, and on the other, Catherine's a bit like, oh, I'm quite in awe of this man because he's quite. I think he's got a presence about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he definitely has. He definitely has an intimidating presence. Actually, when you were talking about this, about how um, they were sort of apologizing for his behavior or making up for his behavior. Um, it just sort of reminds me, I think General Tilney and Sir Walter Elliot have fra like this actual, actually like f fragility, fragile egos about that. Or it just seems like people hover around both of them and caretake to their feelings or explain their behavior away to other people. Like, it seems like there are people for both characters walking on eggshells around them. Like for Sir Walter, there were a couple parts I wrote down around how both Mr. Shepard, the lawyer and Lady Russell are both really careful about how they speak to him about renting Kellen out and and they have to just really soften the blow with telling him that he can't have what he wants he can't move to London he has to move to Bath um it's just interesting when you were describing how the the, ch the children were acting I think there's a parallel there too oh my gosh I just realized another parallel as well is they both have this mirrored personality in their eldest child as well like obviously mm. Elizabeth he's really similar to Sir Walter and 
for I know we don't get to know Frederick that well, but given his whole situation with Isabella and the fact that he seems pretty unfeeling in that, um, I would say that they have a lot in common as well. And Frederick seems to just move around the room, just kind of he just has a presence and like everyone just accepts that he's like this person to be like respected and admired or what have you. Um, and it seems like General Tilney's the same. They just have this. But yeah, isn't that weird that they both have this like eldest child who's kind of like a mirror of them? Yeah. It's really interesting because it flips it on its head, this idea that, you know, obviously back then the eldest son and the eldest child, they were the sort of the important one and the rest were just the ones that came after, especially if you had a son. And the fact that Austin has flipped this round and she's made the younger siblings the ones who are, you know, like I said, the, you know, Henry is more the gentleman out of all of them. And his sister is is much lovelier than their oldest um, eldest one. And obviously, like with persuasion, you've got Anne, who's much more sensible than her older sister. So there's this idea again that she's she's flipped around um and obviously austin herself was kind of a middle child as well so i don't know whether that has anything to do with it too um there was another point i was going to say and i can't remember what it was this is it um the other thing i was going to say was also this idea of kind of role reversal here is i noticed in persuasion again there's she does that quite a lot in terms of the women and the men so you kind of have mrs croft who is she directs everything that goes that happens like on land her husband is obviously when he goes out to sea he's in charge on the ship but mrs croft kind of takes charge when they take the house you've got obviously uh, lady russell who takes charge you've got his wife who before took charge as well she did really well at kind of covering his faults and essentially i think she just likes to play with this role reversal to highlight the villains so you've got yeah especially with the siblings and then the men versus the woman to highlight the fact that sir walter elliot was a bit of a a baddie you know like i said his wife and lady russell took charge um you've got mrs croft who takes charge a lot you've got Anne elliot who's good at taking charge apparently according to, to captain wentworth you've got captain bennick who likes romantic poetry so i think it's just this idea of flipping things on its head which she's just so good at but um, um yeah. just on that point al um it just made me think though is there more of a softness to sir walter elliot because a lot of his issues come from the fact that he's a bit incompetent compared to general tilney who seems a lot more in control of the situation um like general yeah. tilney really lives up to being head of household in a way that sir walter elliot i feel really doesn't um he really sir walter elliot just kind of lives for himself doesn't he he's not he doesn't really take head of household very seriously at all whereas yes. i feel that like general tilney actually takes it more seriously even if he is still selfish that's such a good point because one thing that comes up when i was sort of researching the character and also just reading around him is that he also comes out as a very controlling character so the way he controls i think his children comes across so i mean you've got the bit you know before they go to Northanger abbey he wants to invite catherine to come stay with him because she thinks at this point he thinks at this point she's really rich um and he sort of bursts into the room before Eleanor Tilney had the chance to invite her along. Um, Eleanor sort of says, you know, I was just beginning to make the request, sir, before you came in. And he replies and goes, well, proceed by all means. I know how much your heart is in it. My daughter, Miss Morland, he continued without leaving her time to speak, has been um, basically just proceeds to give this massive speech about why he wants her to come, interrupts Eleanor, doesn't even give her the chance to say and then when they're leaving to go to Northanger Abbey, um, Cat then really shocked by the severity of his father's reproof. So this is when he was talking to, I think, Frederick, um, because of how late they were arriving to the carriage. I think Catherine was also late. So I think he had a bit of a go at her as well. Uh, sort of describes the fact that he was a charming man, but also seemed always to uh, check upon his children's spirits and, you know, scarcely anything was said but by himself. And he was kind of really angry and impatient at sort of the servants when they stop off at the, the inns on the way down to Northanger. So you kind of get a really interesting insight into what he's like around his children. And then I think Catherine gets to join Henry for the remainder of the ride. And the contrast of how different it was when they weren't sat with General Tilney is just yeah, different. And you sort of understand how controlling and just how on edge everyone is when they're around him. He also seems to have like a bit of misogyny, like this kind of dislike or maybe not even dislike, but just complete like absence of thought when it comes to women. Like he's just, yes. he's woman it's blind and deaf. Interesting you should say that as well, because 
I also, on my travels, whilst doing a bit of research, someone also accused him of being a bit of a sexual predator, like being really not great around women, because there's this bit, I think, when um, when she first comes into contact with him in chapter 10, um, Catherine gets really sort of confused and starts blushing by all these compliments he's making to her. And his eyes like still directed towards her, it says. It describes how he's staring at her the whole time whilst he's talking to someone about her. And then when she came, I think, to the house in time to apologise or for the dinner or something, he actually attended her to the front door on his own um, and sort of praised her on the elasticity of her walk, which was a really strange thing because then Catherine has sort of said in the commentary afterwards, like, oh way home all she thought about was the elasticity of her walk which she'd never noticed before and it was such an odd thing to say to a young girl um so people were saying how those were like really uncomfortable things that he was saying especially to try and sort of woo her in a way because he thought that he was that she's a rich girl he's sort of trying to be overly friendly and overly familiar and it was just a really strange thing to do that he's trying to do it on behalf of henry because he's like oh if she's rich then we need to sort of I'm going to do it for Henry in a way because I don't think he's maybe good enough or competent enough to get this catch and I need to make sure that he marries her because he's the youngest son so maybe there's this thing of like he's having to constantly woo her all the time like when she comes to the house he's always going on about the fact that the house you know North Angram is small and the furnishings are not good and it's all simple and this that and the other so it's almost like he's trying to get in her good books but he doesn't really realize who he's dealing with and it's not the person to do that with because she's just going over her head completely because she's not rich and she's also kind of in awe of the fact that she's there so they're both kind of yeah in a it's, it's a weird well I think it's a really interesting concept to think about basically yeah and she's so young too and she had not been out in society had experience like she's she's Jane Austen's really naive heroine. So when you're describing how General Tilney's interacting with her, that does feel sort of gross. There's something creepy about it. And I think one difference I was thinking about between the two of them is between uh, General Tilney and Sir Walter Elliot is there's less said by General Tilney. Like I think Sir Walter Elliot gets has more speaking time in in the novel, but there's a lot of pretty powerful description around General Tilney's aura. And he does have this very controlling, intimidating presence. You can feel his moods in the novel and I he feels very unsafe to me, uh, whereas it's interesting reading this time around. But in the past, when I've read about Sir Walter, he's he's been so absurd to me that I kind of group him into more like a miss. I used to group him into more of a Mr. Collins, like, oof, that was a really awful thing you said, but you're just so ridiculous. I can't take it serious. You're so incompetent. I can't take it seriously. Um, I even group like John Thorpe in that category a little bit, like, because there's this lack of competency, because there's this absurdity it can maybe negate the the being a villain or the damage done but yeah. this time around reading it i actually think that sir walter the way he speaks about people is kind of scary like i think he really demonstrates a lack of empathy and he objectifies people um in a way that i I found kind of pretty off-putting. Um, yeah, there's some there's some dark. I'll, I'm I'm very intrigued, guys. There's some dark topics coming out here. Um, something that I wanted to touch on, Elle, um, at that point that you said about this him potentially being a bit of a um, sexual predator, is I mean the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? Like we can assume that that's obviously went down with um, Frederick and Isabella. Mm -hmm that she was kind of lured into a, a situation that wasn't ideal for her in the end. Um, and so that wouldn't be so surprising. Um, what I was going to say as well, Kaylee, before you said that, which I think is so interesting that you were saying that actually a lot of his behavior is actually quite scary and shows a lack of empathy, shows a lack of empathy. And also I think a lot of the time actually he shows a lot of prejudice. Um, however, I was going to say a difference I feel also is 
Um, for Sir Walter Elliot, it seems a bit more universal, as in, like, um, he actually he doesn't, like, specifically pick on, like, women or men. It's just, like, poor people that seem to be his target or, like... You know what I mean? And, but whereas I feel like General Tilney actually doesn't matter how much money you have um, if you're a woman. Like, he's still going to be kind of weird and creepy around you. Like, he's respectful for Catherine um, because he thinks she's, like, a potential match, but it doesn't show that... Like, his daughter, for instance, like, for all intents and purposes, it's like, why has he been awful to his daughter? Why was he awful to his wife, essentially, when she was married to him? Like, do you know what I mean? I feel like there's a darkness there because yeah. I feel like he just has a complete disrespect for humans full stop and particularly women whereas i feel like sir walter elliot i mean i feel like this is a weird way to justify things but has a respect at least for the wealthy like he's not just like outright you know having a lack of empathy across the board yeah i would agree i'd say general tony was a lot more selfish in it for himself definitely well i guess yeah in a weird twisted way i guess um sir walter elliot is more doing it for the good of the family name if that makes a bit more I don't know and they're standing and maybe General Tony as well with the money but I think he is he is very very selfish and you look at how everyone acts when they're at the you know North Hanger Abbey as well he like you say creating this atmosphere I think Austin is really good at creating these emotionally charged atmosphere even without sometimes dialogue like you say because he doesn't have a lot of dialogue but the way she describes the interactions even just facial expressions or the fact you know he's pacing the drawing room all the time with his watch in hand um and you know yanking on the bell with or well, pulling on the bell with violence it says and ordering dinner to be on the table directly i mean there isn't even much speech in that but he's the way he acts just day to day is just yeah charging this atmosphere which also, I guess, remembering the context of the novel itself, I think you're seeing it through Catherine's eyes. She's at Northanger Abbey there. She thinks it's this, you know, horrible Gothic house where things are lurking in closets and chests. And she gets a bit carried away with the fact that General Tilney does come across as a, a bit of a tyrant. And in volume two, by the time you get to chapter eight, she's already having thoughts of the fact that he murdered his wife, essentially. Um, this description about the fact that she had such a short illness everyone was away from home you've got this horrible tyrant just like in the gothic novels you know it's usually a male who's the baddie she's looking around in you know trunks and boxes the apartments to his dead wife is shut off no one's allowed down there what is he hiding you know so all of this is spinning around in her imagination and she starts to connect him with evil characters from books she's read as well um you know states that he's got the air and attitude of these characters as well and it's just all getting a bit much I think for Catherine and then you find out you know Henry sort of captures her I think in the apartments and going through all these thoughts and it all comes crashing down and the fact that he's not a murderer and his wife died in sort of normal circumstances well you know normal for the day normal circumstances and you know despite the fact that he didn't he didn't like you know walking on her favorite walk she described so therefore he couldn't have loved her and he didn't like the portrait painting so that was hung in his daughter's room and you found we found out that also he did actually put a statue up of her in the church so maybe you're thinking oh maybe he did like her but then again I guess that was probably just done to show his wealth and everything else because that's what people did when you did that but I think um it's a really interesting um character i think just because you've got this context of the fact that it is a bit of a parody of a, a gothic novel but then at the same time you've still got these dark things coming out of it and you can't deny that there's you know this man who is he's not good and he does leave his children really down and upset and there's you know ideas of controlling behavior coming through and um it's not yeah it's a strange one because you've got the two almost running parallel together and i think um it's yeah an interesting one to to break down I think as well what's interesting is um, a lot of the gothic novels that are listed in the book, um, like particularly I am thinking about like, The Castle of Wolvenbach because um, the main like scary thing in that book is actually male oppression and it tends to be these older men. So like of General Tilney's age that they are basically like hunt hunting down these younger women um, and they chase them like across like the whole of Europe. Um, so it's like the whole the whole of the book you have this like fear of this like oppressive male character like there's literally just like you know a couple of days away um, and so I think it is interesting that even though Northanger Abbey is a parody it still really is pulling on the themes that are actually really relevant in 
gothic literature as well. So like you said, it's kind of strange. It's like it's a parody, but also it is picking up on the, the things that do make gothic literature scary in the time that Jane Austen was reading it. Yeah, no, I completely <laughs> agree. And then you've kind of got the final thing that he does of just trying to find a good quote because I found a good one. But um, which is then at the end we find out that because of John Thorpe, he's then gone back to General Tilney when he's left to go back to London. Also, whilst he's in London, everyone has a grand time at Northampton Abbey. You know, they all get to do fun things whilst he's away, and you do notice the change in atmosphere. So you know, it, it is there. But he then finds out that Catherine is not an heiress she hasn't got money so he basically storms back um and demands that she leaves the house and gets Eleanor to tell her basically the fact that they're leaving she's got to leave right away there's no time to do anything um she won't even have a servant attend her in the carriage which is just you know for that that's just unthinkable back then you know a young girl traveling on her own it's just you know that good it's just yes dangerous it's not good for her reputation it's such an awful thing to do for a man to do that so Again, even though it is a parody, for someone to actually do that, it's almost, that's almost not a laughing matter in some ways because it was a, you know, it's, quite, it's a very serious issue and so rude to do that and also just insulting as well. So it goes beyond, like you say, that element of, oh, is he just eccentric and funny? It's actually very, very rude and just, and just not, you know, his and daughter cruel. is so, so embarrassed as well. Um, and you get at the end, she just sort of says, you know, You've been long enough in this house to see that I am but a nominal mistress of it, that my real power is nothing. So you've got this admittance, the fact that she is controlled by her father almost, she can't do anything. Catherine goes, you know, have I offended the general? Um, and she carries on and Eleanor says that um, you've given him no cause for offence, but he is very greatly discomposed. I have seldom seen him more so. His temper is not happy and something has now occurred to ruffle it in an uncommon degree. Some disappointment, some vexation which just at this moment seems important. So he's obviously got like a really struggles with his anger as well and his temper. So you've got this thing, like you say, of people treading on eggshells because they don't want to upset him because he's got this temper and this anger that can come out and just cause chaos on everyone. Which yeah, I think in that... itself is terrifying, right? Sorry, go on, Kaylee. Oh, no, you're good. Yeah, I was just going to say that that is the culminating villainous act that, that he did. Just like you said, it was so improprietous for the time, like it could have completely ruined Catherine's reputation. It was not something done that she would have been by herself without a servant and it was unsafe. So he, like if we're, if we're comparing, he, he put her in physical danger. And I think to an early, earlier point that you mentioned about how Catherine's mind gets kind of carried away that he could have murdered his wife even though that didn't happen the fact that her mind goes there I don't just think it's because she's reading these gothic novels I think it's because he has this atmosphere his moods are incredibly dangerous and make people feel unsafe yeah I just think that's that's a signal that she, even if he didn't murder um, someone that she feels like he's capable of that kind of behavior. That's yeah, so true. Yeah. I actually it's think even true. the, I even think just like the violence in general, like the fact that he's like violently pulls the bell and like, I know these are small things, but these are still scary indicators of greater violence. I think like it's, not, you know what I mean? Like it's one thing, like people say like people banging things and slamming things, but I feel like this is, those are just like smaller signals to something more scary. And like you said, the safety element, the fact that he literally think doesn't think twice. He's like, like, get out of my house. I don't care. Um, just again, shows that lack of em empathy that Kaylee was saying. And we're saying it's scary then. Like, I mean, think about it even now. Like, if you were, like, think about it in the context, say, if you went on a date with somebody and, like, you ended up somewhere and they just abandoned you there or something. Like, that would still be such a dangerous situation. Or um, if for whatever reason, like, you had to try and figure out your way or... Um, like I know so many people who travel solo, solo and I think it's such an incredible thing to do. Um, and like I've done it myself, Kaylee, you travel a lot on your own and everything. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, you, there's dangers that come with that for women. So I feel like, I think even when I think about it now, I think what a terrifying thing to happen that somebody just mm. kicks you out and you've got to find your way home from somewhere that you don't even know. Um, I think it's crazy. But yeah, because it's not her choice as well. You think of solo women travellers today. I mean, obviously it's different. You do it out of, you know, your choice to do it as well. You're empowered by that because you've made that decision. Yeah. Whereas for her, there was no empowerment at all. It was complete disempowerment. It was, 
it was absolutely uncalled for and like you say just incredibly dangerous and incredibly shows I think that point in the novel is the bit for me speaks the loudest about the measure of the man and the character that you're dealing with despite everything despite all the you know is it real is it not is it a parody and all the, the gothic stuff going on around it I think that at the end of the day he still did it regardless of whether it was you know a gothic novel or not that's a really awful thing to do and you can imagine as you say if if he'd been a nice guy you know um, even though Catherine's got an imagination if he'd been a, a nice man and really friendly and not creepy or violent then she probably wouldn't have even gone there to make that assumption and say oh yeah I think he could have murdered his wife because you know the character fits in that kind of description he fits the description of uh, a gothic villain essentially but for me I think personally General Tilney is worse than Sir Walter Elliot but Kaylee, feel free to <laughs> I, I just want to bring up a different topic yeah. that we can kind of talk about both of them on and that is about um, child neglect because I think that that actually shows up more with Sir Walter Elliot in a way that I, I think mm. the Tilneys are scared of General Tilney and you can see that with the way that he sucks the energy out of the room and they're fearful and I think I mean Kaylee you can let me know like I think that does show like an element of abuse in that household but there's something about Sir Walter Elliot's treatment of like Anne that I think is incredibly cruel and destructive and the fact that she has to endure it for so many years because he's always present and she doesn't marry I just think there's something incredibly traumatic about their relationship yeah that was spooky um spooky season um I was about to bring up neglect that was the theme I kept thinking about because Ellis this this was a tremendous act of neglect uh to first of all draw Catherine in and then put her in this horribly dangerous position and I think that he neglects his children. And then I was I was thinking about talking about that uh, in comparison with Walter Elliot. And I think while Walter, Sir Walter Elliot did not do something that put anyone in physical danger to the extent that General Tilney did, I do think the long-term emotional neglect and narcissism is horribly damaging to all of his children, actually, like not just Anne, so one thing that struck me about that is actually when Sir Walter, when we hear that Sir Walter Elliot is upset that Mr. Elliot snubbed Elizabeth and snubbed the family, you know, that is a moment where initially I feel sort of bad for Elizabeth. I was like, oh, like that, that must have really stung that she, she wanted this. And then that must have embarrassed her, made her sad. Like, you know, the typical empathy that would come out and Sir Walter Elliot, the only thing that he talks about regarding that is he says, you know, we were seen together. It was all about the fact that Mr. Elliot was seen with them and how, how that could be damaging to the family name. It, it was nothing about attuning to his daughter and the fact that maybe that was hurtful t to her. Like it was all about appearances. That was what bothered Sir Walter about, about it. That just struck me. Yeah, I think that's such a good thing to point out because I think we were going off the, well, I was going under the impression that obviously is the nicest to Elizabeth, Elizabeth. But yeah, there is the same neglect there. And I mean, I'm not being funny, but Mary's character doesn't come out of nowhere, right? The fact that she has this constant, you know, obsession with having attention and um, she constantly th thinks that she's sick all the time. Um, like that's not, a, they're, not, they're not character traits that I think you just have. I think they're things that develop because of like environmental situations. Um, I don't know. I mean, Kaylee's the best person to discuss this, but I, I think they each have trauma in relation to like the way that they've been treated, like by their father. And you've got to think Mary would have been the youngest when her mum died as well. So she would have been, she would have spent the most time with her dad, with him being a single parent as well. On the most time, that doesn't make any sense. But like, you know what I mean? She was the youngest when he became a single parent. Yeah, I think that's a really that's a, a really good point about Mary um like fancying herself ill is what comes to my mind, having all of these like somatic complaints all of the time to get attention. And I think that, that that shows a tremendous amount of neglect because how it's presented is that, you know, Sir Walter likes Elizabeth because basically she looks like him and has the uh, the same personality, but then 
Um, it, it says Mary had acquired little artificial importance by becoming Mrs. Charles Musgrove. And he basically rates off his younger daughters. Yeah, it, this is the exact wording. His two other children were of inferior value. Like this is the, the, the language is very objectifying. And it's, it's um, like people are, when, when it's Sir Walter's view, I noticed that people are talked about as if they're, they're objects or, or, or money. It's, it, it's around value. And um, this is what, what is said about Anne. Her father found little to admire in her. So totally different were her delicate features and mild dark eyes from his own. There could be nothing in them now that she was faded and thin to excite his esteem. He had never indulged much hope. He had none now of ever reading her name in any other page of his favorite work. So he's written her off. And if she's not able to get married and, and, and be added to the family ancestry book that makes him proud, then, you know, he, he doesn't, isn't really going to pay attention to her. The only time Anne gets positive attention from her dad in the book is when she's gotten her bloom back, so to speak, when she, she's been in Bath for a while and she um, just her complexion is better. And then Sir Walter starts complimenting her appearance. That is the only time that um, he pays her any positive attention. And I think one of the biggest forms of neglect that I see with Sir Walter is his complete lack of awareness of Wentworth's existence um, in conjunction with Anne. Like it was wild to me that at first Anne's the one who has to bring up the that Wentworth exists and that they know him, right? Respective to Mrs. Croft who's moving into their home. And then Mr. or Sir Walter it, it kind of goes, I remember him. He he sought out my opinion about some farmers men who were stealing apples from his orchard and i told i told him to be really harsh on them but he didn't listen to me it was all about soliciting sir walter's opinion on something to feed his ego and but what's really terrible here is that captain wentworth not only had the romantic relationship with anne which sir walter must have been around for on some level but also he asked sir walter for her hand and sir walter said that it would be a de degradation to the family initially which you know was heartbreaking for anne let me see it says sir walter walter on being applied to without actually withholding his consent or saying it should never be gave it all the negative of great astonishment, great coldness, great silence, and a professed resolution of doing nothing for his daughter. He thought it a very degrading alliance. So the fact that he ha has had this interaction with Anne and Wentworth and knows this about his daughter, yet is either pretending that he doesn't remember Wentworth or truly doesn't remember Wentworth, what a horrible form of neglect and that he's not attuned to his daughter's world at all. Yeah. Yeah. Or he just doesn't care anyway. Like I feel like maybe he's just so in his own world that it doesn't even occur to him about other people's feelings. Um, I loved what you said about him and like everything being like quantifiable, like in terms of like people, it's like, what is their value? What is their worth? And how do you scale that is based off? And it is kind of based off their money, but don't we then see that with General Tilney as well? The reason that he kicks Catherine out is because she's, she, he finds out she's not wealthy. And so she's like, you know, she's, she's no longer worth a certain amount that he thought she was, which, you know, for him, he was like, I can treat her kindly because she's worth X amount. That's the exact same with Sir Walter Elliot as well. And, you know, that's why he's so awful to Wentworth to start with. Because I believe later in the novel, he starts being a bit like, oh, who's that guy over there? And it's like Wentworth, because Wentworth's now like really wealthy and like a captain and everybody's paying more attention to him. Um, and I think because he does that as well, just shows like I genuinely, I think he has blind, I think he has poor blindness. Like he just can't see people who are like, not wealthy like he just like he just can't like think about it in his head like he's that prejudiced and that um snobbish snobbish mm -hmm. snob she's, he's got that much snobbery as well oh, he's snobbish <laughs> and i think so is general tilney but there's something very vulgar about the way that Cap um the way that sir walter elliot does it i think where it's just very overt and 
Yeah. It just kind of simply him, isn't it? It's suppose. all about status, isn't it? It's all about status. And I think, I mean, for both of them, I think if you sort of put the question, which I think is something that they're always kind of saying to themselves is, what can I gain from this? And if the answer is nothing, then they don't want anything to do with it, essentially. How can this help me out? How can this make me either richer or a better standing, essentially? And I think, like you say, for Walter Elliott, I think for him, there's much more comes through in persuasion about this social ranking, this idea that he needs to have his place in society formed and he needs to be with the people who he can associate with to make himself look better, be in the right circles. And because obviously we hear that his money is dwindling. So what do you do when your money is dwindling? You try and cement yourself in society because no matter what, he's still got this, you know, inherited title that he can just continue and always show that because at this point I mean you've got a lot of up and coming people who are starting to get money um you know like you say Captain Wentworth you've got people in the navy who are able to you know they're suddenly very wealthy because they can earn their money and they can earn their titles and earn their rankings and for him he doesn't like that you know he doesn't like the fact that the navy are going to be living in his house he's like I can't I can't deal with that you know they have to that's why you know you said earlier they have to sort of put it to him very nicely and be like you know the nice people it's okay um and he can't get on with the fact that people who earn their money and now have you know a standing in society for him it's all he's got to hang on to now is the fact that he's got this inherited title which he's got a you know he was baronet isn't he so i mean that is the lowest ranking out of all of them you know looking from duke downwards it's quite funny that his actually is the lowest you can you can go um before you're just like a, a normal guy essentially so it's it's funny in that sense that he is <laughs> clinging on to that especially because his son has died as well so he doesn't have a son to pass on this inherited title it goes to his cousin who like you say he just he, you know they don't get on and um they seem to be insulting each other all the time so he's he's like clinging on to loose threads i feel <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it clouds his judgment so much. It it clouds his judgment of people's character. And this is where I feel like the neglect is perpetuated because just like he's fickle, he goes from not giving Wentworth the time of day because Wentworth hasn't established himself and doesn't have assets to later on totally endorses Wentworth and, and, and Anne towards the end of the novel. So he's fickle, but he also attracts fickle people and then doesn't see the value in genuine more authentic consistent people when i say that i am i'm thinking about mr elliot right mr elliot snubs the family but then sir walter allows mr elliot to come back into his good graces and then miss it's interesting about miss clay you know, she's not of high birth or high standing, but she feeds his ego. So she's allowed to stick around. And then both of those characters flip on, on, on him are fickle. And then it's the same thing with Lady Dalrymple as well. Anne calls this out. I'm trying to find this part. Anne calls this out where she, she goes, basically, Lady Dalrymple would not give our family the time of day if we were in London, but because we're in Bath she'll deign to associate with us. So Sir Walter is surrounding himself with these fickle people and that's not beneficial to his family, yet he's shunning first Wentworth, who's Anne's soulmate and is, has such a consistent love for her, but then also shunning Anne's very good long-standing friend, Miss Smith. And I just have to read this part because I do think that while Sir Walter is incompetent and um, bumbling and has less of that scary aura as General Tilney, I do think the way he speaks about certain people is pretty damning. And I think the two examples of when it's at its worst are when he talks about Mrs. Smith and then when he talks about anyone who's in the Navy. So this is what he says about Mrs. Smith when Anne says she's going to go visit Mrs. Smith instead of hanging out with Lady Dalrymple at the last minute. And he goes, and who is Miss Anne Elliot to be visiting in Westgate buildings? A Miss Smith? A widow Miss Smith? And who is her husband? One of 5,000 Mr. Smiths whose names are to be met with everywhere? And what is her attraction? That she's old and sickly? 
Upon my word, Miss Ann Elliott, you have extraordinary taste. Everything that revolts other people, low company, paltry rooms, foul air, disgusting associations are inviting to you. But surely you may put off this old lady till tomorrow. She is not so near her end, I presume, but that she may hope to see another day. What is her age? 40? I just... It's like pretty harsh, right? I so rude. Also, why is he on? It's why he's older than him. <laughs> why is he on? Old just... lady. <laughs> so yeah. dramatic. Honestly, that's so rude. Oh, there's two other things that I want to, um, something that you just mentioned as well, Kaylee, that I want to pick up on is you did bring up about Miss Clay. And I think that's also a similarity that we need to consider too is, both of them seem to have this thing where they keep around these like younger women and maybe for General Tilney like we think it's all about the wealth but maybe it's for the same for him a bit of an ego thing um to have like a younger woman um so I think both of them do that and I, it's incredibly creepy to be honest with you um but yeah I just thought that was an interesting similarity that's a, such a good point um drawing that parallel because I, I had not thought of that but just like Ellie, you were talking about how he was commenting on how Catherine was walking and stuff. Sir Walter Elliot also comments on Miss Clay's appearance and talks about how it's improved and she's doesn't he can't see her freckles anymore. So there is this odd people are very concerned that Sir Walter is going to become romantically interested in Miss Clay and that something's not quite right or proprietous here. So there is this creepy energy of, of a younger woman being around and then the interactions are... And invited to stay in home yeah. with their family. Like, maybe yeah. that was more common, but I feel like there is something a little odd about it. I think it's more... I, I think because both of them are just like just creepy guys I think it is a bit strange that they invite these younger women into their homes as opposed to it's not as creepy when we think about the Allens or the gardeners like this couple that you know invite people to stay with them or even Mrs Jennings right you know she's such a motherly figure but I feel like you know there is something creepy about these this these two fathers um who've been widowed for a long time and both of them have in their own rights scariness um being like yes you can come and stay with us under the like the pretense that you're like with my daughter or like with my son like it's it's fine but it's like is it fine it still seems a bit creepy yeah it's a superiority isn't it it's like who can i have and who can i influence and sort of show the world that i've got something to say and something to influence over whether it be you know mrs clay who is going to feed my ego and who i can sort of tag along and she's going to basically just be lapping up everything I'm saying I'm doing and she's so grateful to be around me you sort of get that impression don't you and um he's so wrapped up in his vanity and everything else obviously he doesn't realize the kind of character that Mrs Clay is and you've got the same with General Tilney who again he's so wrapped up with the fact that he's got potentially this money coming you know and wanting to impress her and show off who he is and have this opportunity to show off the house and everything else that um he doesn't actually really take any real interest in Catherine at all or find out properly who she is or her background and all he's done is listen to John Thorpe and it's just feeding this ego and this yeah this vanity that they have for themselves and anyone as I say who can are they going to gain from it yes and they'll jump on it and that's essentially what they both do yeah absolutely and there's another similarity that I just want to pick up on as well and um, and that is to do with this like neglect of their wife because I was just thinking about Sir Walter Elliot and how you said Kaylee you know the daughter who had the most in common with his wife is Anne and for all intents and purposes he's, he's not very nice to Anne at all finds no enjoyment in her character or personality spending time with her and so if she is most like her mum I feel like it's not too much of a stretch to assume that like things weren't so great there either um, he doesn't really mention her much and yeah, I mean, I don't know. I can't even think about him talk. It's so funny as well because I'm so used to obviously reading about him as like a widow. I find it so difficult to even imagine him with a partner. Yeah, so this last reread, I picked up on a couple things that I had passed over. And one of them is, so when they're when they're explaining why Sir Walter and Lady Elliot got together, they basically 
they basically describe her as being really sweet, having really good judgment. And then they talk about how she had one lapse of judgment, which was marrying him because he was handsome and like it because of his, his social standing. But it says something about how she wasn't very happy in the relationship, but that she found solace in her children and in other friendships. So yeah, there's like a small part that insinuates that she wasn't happy. Um, and then just another thing that I saw that I found so interesting is he, he's so superficial. Like he prides himself on, it says he prided himself on staying single for the sake of his daughters. But then it says, Sir Walter, like a good father, having met with one or two private disappointments in very unreasonable applications, prided himself on remaining single for his dear daughter's sake. So, like, to me, that like he proposed to two women out, out of his league after he lost his wife. But he presents as if, oh, I have to be single. And I also felt like it kind of insinuated that Sir Walter Elliot and Lady Russell were friends because Lady Russell didn't really want anything romantic to, to do with him. That's so um, true. That's something that I like picked up when I was reading around it as well. So I'm really glad you you pointed that out. Um, I also find funny because obviously he never does like, you know, marry Lady Russell and and she's described as someone with really good judgment and really good character as well. And obviously because she was friends, you know, best friends with his his wife. I mean, that speaks volumes, doesn't it? Otherwise, it would feel really natural for them probably to marry. It sort of in, in implies that it would have been a natural thing for them to have married each other. But because she doesn't, um, again, that speaks volumes about what she thinks about his character, too. Totally. Yeah, they're just the Sir Walter is so false like in the way he presents things like, OK, I'm going to stay I'm going to stay single to, you know, because I'm this great father. And then I love this line where it's like, for one daughter, his eldest, he would really have given up anything, which he had not been very much tempted to do. Like, I, I don't know. I just think that's funny. Um, like he like he says we'll give up anything, but has he ever really given anything up? And then I'll, I really like that point, too, about Lady Russell. There's clearly clearly there's something she knows about his character that prevents them from getting together because that that really does seem like it would have been the natural thing otherwise i think it's really easy to kind of infantilize um so walter elliot as well do you not feel it's difficult to even envision him as a father like i feel like he comes across so much younger than he actually is and i don't know if that's to do with like his incompetence or what have you but um I f yeah, I, he comes across like an at like a a toddler in some ways. You know, just mm -hmm. the way that he behaves, and so I can kind of imagine why so many women didn't want to marry him. Like, good on them. Like, my gosh, what an absolute nightmare to be married to somebody like that. Um, and he spent all the money as well. So, I mean, the guy's not got much going for him. Um, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think it's. Sorry, mm -hmm. I was just going to say because when you're saying about the age thing, I thought that was a really interesting point that you visualize him as quite as younger, even though he's a lot older. Whereas with General Tilney, I think he's he's described as being sort of still of a, a, a decent age. And yet I feel like when I imagine him, I imagine him as older. So it's interesting. I don't know if it's the same for you both, but there's sort of that opposite there. Whereas the way that General Tilney acts is sort of this older, angry person. And then, like you say, the way that Sir Walter's character is, um, it comes across as like more this immaturity, which is really interesting as well. Um, and what you were saying about, earlier Kaylee about the fact that Anne reflects the characteristics of her mother I think that might be quite similar as well with Eleanor Tony too because she you know she's worried she's going to forget her mother and she likes her the portrait hanging in her room and General Tony doesn't treat Eleanor very well either and whether that's because again she's a female or she reminds him of her mother as well um, there's also that element too so I think that's a really interesting parallel yes and also, doesn't he, sorry, I was just going to say as well, doesn't he stop Eleanor marrying the man that she wants to marry as well? Like, he puts a stop to that. So, again, both parents put a stop to what would be, like, a love match for their children um, in hopes of them marrying for, like, wealth and status and things. So I think that, you know, is equally damaging for, for, their, their, for their daughters. Um, mm, 
Oh, so you know what's really sitting with me that I'm struggling with is what your the description you read about what he says about Mrs. Smith. Like, I was like, thought it was just going to be a slam dunk for me. Like, when you started describing everything else, I was like, nah, this is it. Like, it's going to be General Tilney for me. But when you said that, I was like, that is cruel. It's it's really nasty. Stuff. I also think that Sir Walter is just very, he's very cowardly, though. And I think he hides behind those words. He's very good at saying a lot of things and saying those horrible words and being able to sort of, you know, like we we're saying, I think we've got Sir Walter where we've got very much his words which are expressing his character and who he is a lot more maybe in persuasion then you've got general tilney whereas actually maybe it's more his actions that are, are speaking more because of the way he is so again that's it's quite difficult or maybe challenging to compare the two because maybe we have more yeah more words which we can draw upon for a subaltern i think he's more involved in persuasion that's just i don't know maybe just my judgment when i'm reading it um, whereas general tilney it is very much his actions so the action of actually getting Catherine out of the house. He didn't actually say that. It was Eleanor who delivered it to her. You know, the action of, you know, storming around and pulling on the bell and descriptions of him being rude to the servants and, um, you know, the description of him looking at Catherine really pointedly and things like that. So you've got a lot of description about his, his actions going on as well. So I think that's quite interesting. Yeah, I think that's such a good point about... With General Tony, it's around dis- description and the atmosphere and then actions. And then with Sir Walter, it's words. But And I think the question is how damaging are words? And just to go back to an earlier point, I completely agree that Sir Walter's so immature, that infantile, that he is considered absurd. And so people don't see him as a villain because they're just like, oh, you're just you're just helpless. You're just immature. But his words are actually, I, I think, pretty damaging. Um, I have a couple other things I wanted to share when I think he's at his meanest, like some of his low points. And very, very okay, quickly. can I just jump in very quickly yeah. last on that yeah. point? I know this is I got in my head. There is a quote by I think it is Jane Austen where she says it isn't what we say or think that defines us; it's what we do. So I just want to throw that out there. As a little journey, you know, <laughs> thing about actions, you know, that was Joan Austen's current take on it. <laughs> um, okay, I love, oh, I love. That. That's my slam dunk in there. <laughs> Whatever you're gonna come with, Kaylee. This is what Jane Austen said. <laughs> this is what Jane Austen said. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna just chuck that in there. <laughs> oh man, that slays me because that's one of my favorite quotes yeah. too. Uh, incredible. Oh man, slam dunk. Okay, well, I can recover from that. <laughs> Um, okay, so the Navy, when he's talking about the Navy, I, I can't, when he's talking about the Navy, so he goes, a man, okay, it cuts up a man's youth and vigor most horribly, a sailor grows old sooner than any other man, a man is in greater danger in the Navy of being insulted by the rise of one whose father, um, whose father might have disdained to speak to, and of becoming prematurely an object of disgust himself than in any other line. So again, the objectification, like someone being an object of disgust. And then when he's talking about this Admiral Baldwin, he goes, he's the most deplorable looking personage you can imagine. His face, the color of mahogany, rough, rugged to the last degree, all lines and wrinkles. And he goes on about gray hairs. And then he goes, I shall not easily forget Admiral Baldwin. I never saw quite so wretched an example of what seafaring life can do. I know it is the same with them all. They're all knocked about and exposed to every climate and every weather till they're not fit to be seen. It's a pity that they're not knocked on the head at once before they reach the Admiral Baldwin's age. I don't know why I've never picked up on that and how bad that is, because just reading it then in isolation, I'm like, that is awful. And also, it's, there's almost this obsession with him, as we said before, about looks and also growing older as well. It's all to do with the fact, you know, your skin looks rough and everything else. And you're, it's all, he's almost scared. He doesn't want to look like he's old. Again, links to this idea that you try, you imagine him as he is being younger, because I think that's maybe what he try and portrays himself as. So he's almost got it in for people who look old or look like they're weathered in any way um but also interesting it's all about looks because i mean i mentioned this i think before in other podcasts but you know society back then it was all about looks all about what you portrayed it was you know this idea of polite society and if you did not present yourself well you know it didn't matter what was going on behind closed doors if you looked good and you presented yourself 
well in society that's all that mattered so I think he's he's really an example of that kind of person who was yeah really really exemplifies those those people who in society who are like that especially in Bath because people in Bath are like that I mean again in our Bath podcast plug in this one talk a lot about the architecture which presents this idea as well of being really neat and orderly out front um but you know behind the scenes things were messy and they did not look good um yeah I mean, we were saying like the Northanger Abbey obviously has all these ties to the Gothic, but when you're reading that and then you just describe it, Elle, like his obsession with like appearance, it's giving picture of Dorian Gray. Like that's what, that's like, he, he would make such a trade. Like <laughs> he's like that obsessed with it, isn't he? Almost if he could make the same trade, but with his book, like his history book, you know, and he could be like, that, that could sustain him for life um maybe that's why he reads it it does sustain him in some way like keeps him young and youthful keeps him feeling like he's at his prime i'm getting visions now of you know like on tangled you know the disney tangled and you've got mother gothel who like just strokes (laughs) you've just just, like stroking his book every night like give me give me use give me life (laughs) it's true though isn't it like it is it's it's a genuine fear for him and i feel like that's interesting like for sir walter for sir, for sir walter elliot his fear is this loss of appearance whereas i feel like for general tilney it's this um his loss of wealth seems to be like his biggest fear um but i i think there is something in that that like you said there's a cowardice and there's also an immaturity to Sir Walter Elliot. This is obsession with appearance. The, his words, even though they are really cruel, they kind of don't land because you can kind of be like, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, like think about Wentworth. Like are any of us sat there being like, gosh, like, yeah, what's Wentworth doing? Like what an ugly guy. But no, we all like just love Wentworth for who he is, his character, you know, his constancy and all of that kind of thing. So I feel like it doesn't really matter what he says. And also with like Mrs. Smith, right? We all like appreciate her as Anne's like good friend who gives her the lowdown on Mr. Elliot and stuff. Like we don't, any of these characters that he says like horrible stuff about their appearance, like it's not landing with any of us because none of us actually give a flying fig and we think he's full of rubbish anyway. Um, so I feel like that it's about for me start, makes him less of a villain in the sense start, that it doesn't, yeah, 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 that it doesn't land. Mm. Yeah. And that also... Whereas with General Tilney, it lands. Like I'm scared of him. Yeah, they're always they're like short, sharp, angry outbursts. Where with, you know, Sir Walter Elliot, it's these elaborate speeches where he's just throwing words out at people and insults. And it is, I mean, they're they're horrible and vicious, but they are just almost overpacked in a way to the point, like you say, they almost lose meaning because of just how elaborate and how much he goes on about it, and the fact that it is all about he goes, you know, he insults people's appearances, which again, appearance isn't everything at this point in society so yeah but it's performative is right right he always does it behind closed doors he does it when no, he's not saying it's these people's faces he's not like my goodness like what admiral baldwin or whatever <laughs> never seen anyone look as rough as you he he says yeah. it like when he's not around and when he's just surrounded by people that he knows anyway so i feel like it is all talk with him isn't it because i can't imagine him for one second ever being able to say this to somebody's face and even the description when he rejects wentworth i swear that it's not that he turns around to wentworth and says absolutely not blah 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 he i feel like a lot of it's in like his facial expressions the fact that he just like walks away and ignores and thinks to himself like what an absolute disgrace that would be i'm not too getting involved with that like it's not even a it, for me it's never come across as like this like verbal attack that he's done um and so i'm just like it's interesting um yeah, yeah that's it that's an interesting point that a lot of the mean things that he says aren't directly to the people um and it's interesting i feel like before you're right that he goes on these long monologues and they start off so absurd and ridiculous it's almost like oh gosh like i'm not even gonna listen to this whole thing but because i was focused on him on this reread i'd 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 get to that point i'd be like oh absurd and then i'd pause and i go wait what did he just add to that that's really messed up like that is super dehumanizing he basically said sailors aren't worth continuing to live like once their appearance goes or if they don't have wealth to their name and it's interesting i my love language is words of affirmation so i think words are really powerful for me like either positive or more critical and so i think looking at some of these 
speeches he gives, even if they aren't directly to the person, I'm like, that's messed up that no one calls him on that or that he gets away with that. And then I think too, you're right that there isn't right. Like, um, Admiral Baldwin doesn't hear this. Thank goodness. Right. But it's just sort of, what is the effect that how much is Sir Walter exaggerating or, or how much does he actually think this? And what is the effect if he thinks these things on at least his closer circle, his family? Because even at the end, it's sort of funny. He says, what does he say? He like yeah. accepts Anne and Wentworth and he goes, what does he say? He goes, saw him repeatedly by daylight i'd wentworth well he was very much struck by his personal claims um felt that his superiority of appearance might not be unfairly balanced against her superiority of rank um he even like doesn't think that and he he thinks that wentworth is more attractive than Anne. like he continues to undervalue Anne, and i think at the end of the day, while he doesn't overtly, his actions aren't overtly as harmful as General Tilney's, I still think that that longstanding perpetual neglect and undervaluing of people in his circle is psychologically harmful. Um, I yeah. agree. As, as you were talking then, I mean, obviously I'm advocating general tilney because this is my debate corner but like on a personal level as you say i when you said about words of affirmation that was what i was thinking as well um but actually when you read those things out and for me personally that's my love language as well so actually in terms of which would affect like me more i think like you say the words that sir water is saying it they're they're awful and i think someone trying to deal with that every day and the way he talks to his children and yeah everything he's saying I think it's you know I think there's always a debate isn't there is the actions speak louder than words but I've also always been an advocate of words are just as powerful and obviously you know Jane Austen is a writer as well so um it's quite good that you brought that up and um yeah as much as you know the actions of General Tilney are awful I think words can be just as brutal as actions too so yeah I think that's definitely true I think there's also the sense that we can um get rid of General Tilney by the end of the book as well because I feel like Henry just he gets disowned and like so him and Catherine can just live a happy life together um whereas I feel like there would never be any escape in Sir Walter Elliot because he doesn't do anything that's like worthy of being cut off necessarily um and so it's a bit more of like an awkward one that he would be this ever-present figure that would just be awful to be around um because he has such terrible views and also he has views and values that aren't reflective of Anne and Wentworth like I think I'd really struggle with that um like especially as I've got older I really find it difficult to like spend time with people who do don't share like the same values like if they have like even like things like this like if they really objectify people or they're very materialistic those things like I really can't bear it nowadays like it really just doesn't sit well with me and whereas in the past I probably could have I, I could I tolerated it more and I was just like oh I'll just get on because of like x y and z z I can't do that the same way now and I just think yeah there's something in like the the constant tip of, of of him that I think I'd really struggle with um mm -hmm. whereas I feel like I could just get like be like bye general tell me like I'm I'm not coming in your presence again scary person you know yeah i think you'd be able to pin just like i think that's such a good point izzy like with general tilney you'd be able to pinpoint the horrible act that he did like you abandoned me you put me in danger i was unsafe like this it's like very obvious what general tilney did versus sir walter it's just more of a slow gradual um way of showing up unkindly unempathetically and neglectfully so he's more this like persistent festering wound whereas general tilney is the larger wound that you actually might be able to heal from who's worse though who is the <laughs> i'm really struggling now now that we've done this i'm like ooh. i'm really struggling because they're both i think they're both very 
good villains. <laughs> well written characters for villains. I think they're and they're I think they're a really, really good comparison and I'm finding it challenging to decide which one. I think maybe like I was saying, you could get rid of General Tilney, but part of me is also like, um, there's a reason that you'd want to get rid of him. And maybe that's the indicator that he, for me that he's worse is that like, I would have to cut him off. Like he, like we're not associating with this guy anymore. And the fact that Henry, his son cuts him off and like Catherine is like terrifying situation. Her family, they're all in the Allens are all like shocked at his behavior. I just think he's an all around bad guy. And so I think for me, it would have to be General Tilney who's worse. Yeah. 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 I honestly, if I'm really thinking about it, I think it's General Tilney. I think that he would cause, he caused more physical harm. Like he, like he actively put her in danger. And again, there are a lot of signals that he's not safe. Like he doesn't feel safe. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say I would also argue that he's also I know like we say we don't he doesn't express as many words, but I think if we were to delve into, you know, hypothetically their family life, I know it's fictional, but if you were to go into their family life, I'm sure you would also find signs of kind of abuse and the fact neglect through words and through the emotional side as well that maybe Sir Walter does if we're going to go on a like a really serious level because I think he's also really awful to his children too and like you say there's a theme of neglect which keeps coming up and I think not only do his actions reflect this but I think you know you look at Eleanor and she comes across to me as someone who's very timid and quite shy uh, potentially she doesn't she comes maybe across as a little bit snobby at first because she doesn't say much and actually it's just because I think she's just not confident and that's been taken away from her and as you say and then Henry just decides to abandon him anyway because of just how awful he is and you know as we've been sitting here talking about it you've thrown up some really really good points about Sir Walter earlier which I think has cemented him in my mind as even more of a villain than I thought because I thought he was a bit of a again a caricature a bit funny you know like a, a Mr Collins type one he comes up with all these ridiculous sentences but there is a a villainous a really like dark villainous side to him as well if you want to go down that route um but I would have to say I think General Tilney is the full package traditional villain out of the two um I think he's probably worse so I would also agree with that yeah I agree with that and I think both characters if they lived in modern day would need to go to therapy right <laughs> like I think and I think kids that as well would need yeah therapy. Yeah, I actually, yeah, when I said that, I meant their, I meant their kids. Um, because I think Sir Walter's neglect, um, I think it would be important to validate the neglect because it's a little bit more covert what he's doing, but I think it's still harmful. But I agree in the traditional sense, General Tilney is more of a villain. And I think, Izzy, that was a really good point that when it comes down to the person who has to be cut off, because things are so harmful versus the person where, okay, this is not great, but we can still tolerate this person being around. That, that's a pretty good sign of who's the greater villain. Yeah, I think the way that he draws all the energy out the room as well. I think, I think even though we don't hear like the direct like abuse to his children, I think it's the clear sign that there is like this abusive nature to him there is the fact that they are their personalities change so much in his presence i think shows that neither of them felt very safe around him um and i think for good reason because clearly the guys i mean if he's willing to treat a stranger like a, a woman who was under his protection but is essentially like a stranger and like if somebody else's family so poorly like i mean you can't even imagine can you how you treat his children so um yeah i think it's quite distressing so i think we've all decided then general tilney is the winner of villain off 2024 yay Go team. It's, yay. <laughs> it's like that's it general tilney has been has been crowned um number one villain 
So I feel like at some point we'll have to. I think we say this every year, but we'll have to do like a villain off with the villains. <laughs> you know where they have like the like the villain oh, off with the villain <laughs> off, and it's like we go we go back and whoever won, they all get compared or something. I don't know, but yeah, I've really enjoyed this, and thank you to both of you because I know you both do like so much research for this episode. So I really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, it's been a fun one. I hope everyone listening has enjoyed it as well, because um, I have had a great time going through this. And um, as always, we really love hearing your suggestions for other villain offs. I know a lot of you have dropped me messages with different ideas and some of them coming through have been so great. Um, so yeah, it's always good to, to keep them, keep me in the loop with your thoughts on that. And yeah, please do follow, subscribe, like, share the podcast. It really does help um, we grow the podcast a bit more. And obviously you can find me on all podcasting platforms and on YouTube. But that's everything from us. Kaylee, Alice, do you want to let everyone know where they can find you? Sure. So I'm um, half underscore agony underscore half underscore hope. Um, and yeah, you can find me there on Instagram. Would love to talk to you about your thoughts on the villain off or anything else. That is probably one of the best Instagram handles because it's one of the best quotes, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm on, I'm on Instagram and you can find me at historian underscore Ellis. Amazing. And you can find both of them on um, many an episode. Um, so yeah, I will try and tag as much as possible below, but I'm sure you'll be able to find the episodes pretty easily because there is that many of them now. Um, and yeah, that is everything from us today and we will see you in another episode.